Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a scientific content specialist at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installments in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series entitled Cell Line Authentication, Protect Your Research and Reputation, presented by Kevin Grady. Kevin Grady is the Manager of Product Management at ATCC. In this presentation, Mr. Grady will provide an overview on ATCC's authentication products and services, showcasing four of our tried and true tools for verifying your cell's identity and identifying mycoplasmal contamination. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as the time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. So with that, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Kevin Grady. Thanks, Brian, and hello, hello everyone. Founded in 1925, ATCC is a nonprofit organization with its headquarters in Manassas, Virginia, and an R&D and Services Center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. ATCC is the world's largest, most diverse biological materials and information resource for cell culture. ATCC is recognized as the gold standard for biological material. ATCC is also an innovative standards organization featuring multiple products and services for characterizing and authenticating cells and microbes, which leads us to the topic of today's presentation how to restore and maintain reproducibility in your research. In today's presentation, we will first discuss the grave impact of using misidentified or contaminated cells in your research. Then we will move on to discussing how one can minimize or eliminate the likelihood of having misidentified or contaminated cells in your lab. We will review various methods to authenticate your cells, short tandem repeat profiling, better known as STR, and CO1 barcoding for species determination. We will also discuss how to detect mycoplasma contamination in your cultures, so that if necessary, you can take appropriate action to resolve the situation. Okay, so we will get started and discuss the authentication process. ATCC knows that there is a need to provide cell authentication services to the research community. ATCC is recognized as the leader in cell authentication and characterization, and we want to provide this knowledge and skill to the research community to better ensure the sanctity and reliability of life science research. So let's talk about the consequences of using misidentified cell lines. It's really pretty basic. If you're using a cell line that's not, not authenticated in your research, then you're at a high risk for loss of the cell line itself if it was mislabeled or contaminated with another cell line, or loss of time that was spent by you and your technicians, and the money on the reagents and lab consumables used in that research. If you publish something that's potentially contributing to misinformation in the public domain, and if your colleagues try the same experiences with the bona fide cell line, then you're likely to see discordant or irreproducible results. This can result in, the, in a retraction of your publications, and possibly worse of all, a tarnished reputation. Using misidentified, misidentified cell lines bears a high economic impact. In 2015, a study by Friedman and colleagues aimed to estimate the direct costs of irre irreproducible research. They did a search of NIH reporter, uh, uh, sorry, they did a search of NIH reporter for projects using cell line or cell culture. And this search suggests that NIH currently funds about $3.7 billion annually on research using cell lines. Given that, potentially a quarter of these research projects apparently use misidentified or contaminated cell lines, the monetary loss could be up to $925 million. And even if only 10% of the research is conducted using misidentified cell lines, the loss is still upwards of $370 million. Another area of concern regarding cell authentication 
is the presence of mycoplasma in your cultures. It's very easy to get mycocontamination, but you cannot easily see it. With fungal or bacterial contamination, you can see obvious changes in the culture, such as turbidity or color changes in the media. But with mycoplasma contamination, there's often no such cue. But mycocontamination can have several deleterious effects on your cultures, such as chromosomal aberration, disruption of nucleic acid synthesis, changes in protein expression, decrease in cell proliferation, a decrease in transfection rates, or even cell death. And once you have a mycocontamination, it's difficult to clean up the cultures. Antibiotics against mycoplasma do exist, but they are often not effective unless you use very high doses, and oftentimes the high doses themselves can prove detrimental to your cells. So the best bet is continuous surveillance so that you can find contamination at an early stage. ATCC provides several different authentication services to help researchers ensure that they're using reliable biomaterial for reproducible and credible research. These include sterility testing, virus testing, and phenotyping. But for the rest of the presentation, we're going to focus on the three most important services to ensure well-authenticated biomaterial, those being SDR profiling, mycoplasma detection, and CO1 testing. So we're going to talk about short tandem repeat or STR profiling. Probably the best way of authenticating your cell lines as far as cell identity goes is short tandem repeat or STR profiling. STR profiling has been available for some years now and is the same technology that forensics labs use to identify individuals for paternity testing, linking suspects to crime scenes, and identifying victims. Since there are many kits out there for STR for forensics purposes, it made sense to develop a standard using this technology for the cell line, and cell line identity. So STR profiling for human cell authentication was established as an ANSI standard in 2012. The standard describes a consistent and universal, universally applicable method for authenticating new and established cell lines and their criteria for use. So what is STR profiling and why is it the best technology for authenticating cells identity? The technology is based on identifying target sequences based on microsatellite DNA. Microsatellite DNA are short repeats of two to six base pairs that can repeat from five to 50 times. The repeats can either be simple and right next to each other or complex and separated by short intervening sequences. The protocol itself only requires one to two nanograms of DNA and one to two fragments. The analysis is easy to read. As a result, it's returned as a series of discrete alleles, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Each allele can be converted into a numerical value and entered or retrieved in a database. The STR markers are distributed throughout the genome. The matches are possible even with the loss of a chromosome. Microset satellite DNA is highly variable with populations, making this a highly informative test for identifying cells. Now that we understand the characteristics of STR, now we'll run through the procedure. Prepare the sample at an optimal cell density of 1 times 10 to the 6 cells per mil. Before handling the sample collection card, which is Wattman FTA paper, thoroughly clean the work surface. With gloved hands, carefully open the sample collection kit and remove the sample collection card. Please wear gloves when handling the sample collection cards to avoid cross-contamination with your own DNA. Clearly label the sample collection card with the cell line name and designation. Carefully mix and spot 40 microliters of the cell suspension prepared at 1 times 10 to the 6 cells per mil in the center of the circle on the inside of the sample collection card. Allow the sample collection card to dry in the laminar flow hood at room temperature. Recommended drying time is at least 15 minutes. When the sample collection card is dry, place it in the provided multi-barrier pouch with the provided desiccant pack and send to ATCC. At ATCC, the procedure starts with your submitted sample of DNA, which is subjected to multiplex PCR, which allows for the addition of fluorescent dye and the amplification of the DNA with primers to the various loci. We then perform capillary electrophoresis using a standard run in parallel with an allelic ladder that corresponds to the validated alleles. The result is an electropharogram. We then perform the data analysis and compare the result 
to either a database or a reference sample. The, ge the general requirements for running the assay are a gene sequencer, thermocycler, prim primers to the various loci, and an SDR database of the cell lines. But the most important component of all is a skilled technician. It cannot be understated how important it is that you have someone who is adept at reading electropharograms analyzing your data. So I've explained the characteristics of STR profiling, and I've shown you how the assay is run. Now I'm going to show you how STR is analyzed. I'm going to start by showing you just one locus, D16, S539, or D16 for short. So D16 is characterized by the repeat motif GATA, as we see here. In the left panel is an example of an individual that is homozygous at D16. Each GATA repeat is an allele. As you know, you inherit one set of chromosomes from your mother and one from your father. So you can see here that the mother donated a chromosome with eight repeats at this loci, as did the father. We can count eight repeats, and the peaks co-migrate, so you get a single peak at eight. On the right-hand panel, we have an individual who's heterozygous at locus D16. We count 10 repeating units, or alleles, from the maternal and nine from the paternal chromosome. We see two peaks that run with the allelic ladder indicating the alleles at this locus are nine and 10. Some other examples are shown below for three individuals, Tom, Dick, and Harry. For low side D16, Tom has two peaks migrating with nine and 13 repeating units on the allelic ladder. So he's heterozygous at D16. Dick has one peak with 10 repeats, indicating that it's co-migrated, so he's homozygous at D16 for 10. And then Harry is heterozygous for 9 and 12. So that's just one locus, but for the complete STR profile, you look at all the allele numbers at all the loci. Here's an example of how STR can differentiate between two human cell lines. Here we're comparing K562, a chronic myelogenous leukemic cell line, with WS1, a normal fibroblastic cell line. For K562, we see, we see two peaks at 11 and 12 at locus D5, one peak at 8 for locus D13, and at D7, a peak at 9 and 11, and so on. For WS1, we see a single peak of 13 at D5, a single peak locus, D13, co-migrating at 12 on the allelic ladder. Two peaks, one at 9 and one at 10 for D7. So you can see here we have two unrelated, separate individual cell lines, each with a unique STR profile. We just looked at how STR can distinguish between two unre unrelated cell lines. Now we will look at how STR can show relationships between cells. In this slide, we have results from two different cell lines, HAAE2, an aortic endothelial, an aortic endothelial cell line, and HFAE2, a femoral artery endothelial cell, from the same individual. Here you can see that at each locus, we have the same results regarding repeat counts. For example, at locus D5, we have two peaks at 12 and 13 for both cell lines. At D7, two peaks for 8 and 10 for both lines. So the results, con the results confirm the cells are related due to the identical SGR profiles for the two cell lines. In this slide, I'm showing you what cellular contamination might look like in your SGR profile. The upper electropharogram is the human ovarian cell line, SKOV3. The lower is SKOV3, cells contaminated with another human cell line. Samples with more than three peaks at more than three loci may be due to cellular contamination. You can see the additional peaks indicated by the red arrows. These are definitely not artifacts. Many of the additional peaks meet the general consensus threshold of being greater than 20% of the allele size like in D13 here, D7, and D16. 
This is what cellular cross-contamination will look like. From the previous sample results, you can see how SCR analysis can easily detect cell identity and relatedness among cells and detect cross-contamination. You can be assured that your human and mouse, TR, mouse SCR results from ATCC are fully validated and authenticated, as ATCC has developed its protocols and control database in conjunction with leading standard organizations. The testing and analysis are performed under ISO 9001 and ISO 17025 quality standards. You can easily submit your samples to ATCC. First, purchase the FTA sample collection, collection kit from ATCC, then follow the supplied protocol to spot the FTA, FTA paper, dry the sample, and mail the dried sample to ATCC with results back in three to five days. About mycoplasma detection and the services provided by ATCC. As we already discussed, mycoplasma can be very harmful to your cultures and exhibit many different negative effects on your research results. It's very easy to get mycoplasma contamination, but you cannot easily see it. With fungal or bacterial contamination, you can see obvious changes in the culture, such as turbidity or color changes in the media. But with mycoplasma contamination, there's often no such cues. That is why it's so important to regularly screen your cultures for mycoplasma. There are three main tests for mycoplasma, direct culture, indirect staining, and PCR-based testing. Over the next few slides, we will discuss all three methodologies. The direct culture method uses both agar and liquid broth. Samples are incubated and subcultured on days 3, 7, and 14 after inoculation. Results are read separately by two individuals at 14 days of incubation. This allows for isolation of cultivatable strains as apparent by the appearance of characteristic mycoplasma colonies on the agar media. This methodology is a gold standard for detection with the highest sensitivity. It is typically outsourced to specialized labs, such as ATCC, because it requires highly trained personnel to administer. The assay takes up to 28 days for completion. All mycoplasma are not cultivatable in vitro. As a result, there may be a need to employ other methods to ensure complete authentication. The indirect culture method makes use of the binding properties of fluorocomb hoax DNA stain. The stain will bind the DNA of mycoplasma and infected organisms and can be easily detected by using a microscope equipped with appropriate fluorescence optics. One drawback to this methodology is interpreting the results. As the hoax stain does not discriminate between mycoplasma and other bacteria, it will stain any extracellular DNA present. For this reason, ATCC only offers direct and indirect mycoplasma as a bundle. Direct filter detects culturable mycoplasma, and indirect the methodology detects non-culturable mycoplasma. In response to the long lead time of the direct culture method, PCR testing for mycoplasma has been developed. However, this method must be able to prove sensitivity comparable to the traditional methods outlined by the USP and EP and accepted by regulatory authorities. ATC testing services uses FTA paper in the same fashion as we discussed for collecting SGR samples. You prepare your sample for mycoplasma testing at an optimal cell density of 1 times 10 to the 6 cells per mil. For adherent cells, you simply scrape the cells into the culture medium to release. Do not use trypsin or EDTA, as both of these reagents will disrupt the mycoplasma. Before handle, handling the, the sample collection card, thoroughly clean the work surface. With gloved hands, carefully open the sample collection kit and remove the sample collection card. Wear gloves when handling the sample collection card to avoid cross-contamination with operator mycoplasma. Carefully mix and spot 40 microliters of cell suspension prepared in the center of the circle on the inside of the sample collection card. Allow the sample collection card to air dry in the laminar, laminar flow hood at room temperature. When the sample collection card is dry, send it to ATCC. The sample card is tested using ATCC Universal Mycoplasma Detection Kit, which enables mycoplasma detection over a wide range of species through the use of universal primers specific to the 16S ribosomal RNA gene 
combined with touchdown PCR. This strategy employs a high annealing temperature in the initial cycle that de decreases with subsequent cycles to increase the likelihood of primers binding to the specific targets, reducing the chance that nonspecific targets will be amplified. In this case, mycoplasma contamination is easy, easily recognized as a distinct PCR product ranging in size from 434 to 468 base pairs. Results are available within five business days. So ATCC offers two testing services for mycoplasma, direct and indirect culture bundled together and a PCR-based testing. Indirect testing uses hoax stain and provides results in seven to 10 business days and direct culture testing performed as per the FDA's points to consider will provide results in four to five weeks. PCR-based testing provides results in five days. The testing and analysis are performed under ISO 9001 and ISO 17025 quality standards. And for those do-it-yourselfers, ATCC also supplies researchers with the, with the PCR-based universal mycoplasma detection kit that they can run in their own labs. Now we'll talk about how we test for, uh, for distinct species of your cell lines using cytochrome, ox cytochrome oxidase barcoding. The cytochrome C oxidase subunit one, known as the CO1 gene, can be thought of as an internal identification system for all animals. The CO1 gene is an ideal target for species discrimination, as this gene is conserved across higher eukaryotes, including insects, fish, birds, and mammals. CO1 is located on mitochondrial DNA, meaning that it's present in large copy number and has a relatively fast mutation rate that aligns with speciation time scales. An approximately 650 base pair region of CO1, known as the barcode region, is amplified with degenerate primers followed by DNA sequence analysis by the Sanger method. The obtained DNA sequence is then compared against a known standard for species confirmation. Use of CO1 testing at ATCC replaces isoenzymology in determining the true species of a cell line. The CO1 gene is conserved genetic material found in the mitochondria among closely related species and across diverse phyla in the animal kingdom. Based on the species-to-species -species sequence variability of the CO1 gene, ATCC scientists developed a PCR-based speciation assay by designing unique primer pairs that recognize only a specific species and produce amplicons in a multiplex PCR re reaction with sizes of no less than 20 base pairs apart. The ATCC CO1 assay is capable of distinguishing cell lines of pig, human, cat, Chinese hamster, rhesus monkey, sheep, horse, African green monkey, rat, dog, mouse, rabbit, goat, and cow origin. When the species of a cell line remains in question, a 650 barcode region of the CO1 gene is sequenced for ver verification purposes. In the photograph on the left, amplified fragments were detected by ethidium bromide staining on a 4% agarose gel. Lane 1 shows the, the 100 base pair ladder. Lane 2 shows the multiplex performance of oleonucleotide pairs specific for the 14 different animal species. The template of the reactions consisted of a half, a, a half to one nanogram mixed DNA contributed from all 14 species with primers in the master mix. The CO1 testing analysis are performed under ISO 9001 and ISO 17025 quality standards. I hope you now have a better appreciation and understanding of the detrimental effects using a misidentified or contaminated cell could have on your work. And hopefully you will implement the practices presented here to ensure the use of well-authenticated and characterized cells in your lab. And remember, ATCC is here to help you accomplish that via our services for STR profiling, CO1 barcoding, and mycoplasma detection. Or if you prefer to do it yourself, ATCC supplies the Universal Mycoplasma Detection Kit. Thank you for attending our webinar today. I will now pass the microphone back to Brian, and then, we'll be happy, and then we will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Kevin. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session. Uh, please use the chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. 
The recorded webinar presentation will be made available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. And it looks like Brian Chase, ATCC Supervisor of Laboratory Operations and a true subject matter expert on our SCR profiling and mycoplasma detection services has joined us to uh, help answer your questions. So um, for the first question that has uh, come in, um, I'm going to send this one to Kevin. Uh, actually, the first few are around uh, mycoplasma. So Kevin, what are the common types of mycoplasma found in cell culture? All right, thanks, Brian. Uh, so the most common ones, um, I mean, there, there's you know, many different types of mycoplasma species out there. But um, you know, it's been reported that there's really four species that constitute the majority of mycoplasmas that are commonly found to infect cell cultures. Um, those are Mycoplasma herinus, Mycoplasma argini, Mycoplasma fermentans, and Mycoplasma orale. All right, excellent. And um, Kevin, can you talk about the primers that are used in the Universal Mycoplasma Detection Kit? Uh, assay, which um, you know is uh, ATCC part number 30-1012K. Yep. So the the universal forward and reverse primers are uh, components of the kits. They come with it. Um, the primers target the highly conserved 16S uh, ribosomal RNA region of the mycoplasma genome and generate a specific PCR product ranging from about 434 base pairs to 468 base pairs. Okay, and um, could you use the kit, um, the mycoplasma detection kit that is, to test the cell culture supernatant for mycoplasma instead of a cell lysate? Well, since mycoplasma are generally cell associated, you know, they sort of, uh, are, you know, are parasitic to the surface of the cells. Um, the most sensitive test um, involves a cell pellet, where you actually collect the, the cell and do the license from there. Um, so for best results, we recommend starting with a cell pellet. But if that's not practical and you don't want to sacrifice your culture to perform the test, um, you know, a one mil culture supernatant can be centrifuged, and then the pellet um, from that centrifugation is then treated with a lysis mix that's in the kit and um, that can be run as your test sample. Um, it's, it, it's, it, it'll work, um, it's not optimal, but it's still gonna be very sensitive uh, to detect the presence of myco mycoplasma contamination. Okay, and um, here's a, a, a question that, that we get quite a bit at ATCC. Can a mycoplasma contamination be actually eradicated? Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll give it a yeah. So, yes, it can be, but um, it's very, very challenging. So, you know, the best recommendation and best practice is that if your culture is found to be contaminated with mycoplasma, it's best to discard the culture and start all over. But, you know, obviously there might be cases where that you can't do that. You don't have a cell bank to go to. Um, so, you know, there are processes that you can do to try and save the culture if it is mycoplasma contaminated. Um, so there are antibiotics that are out there that uh, have some anti-mycoplasma action, um, such as plasmacin, BM cyclin, or ciprofloxacin. Um, basically, you'll treat your cells um, with those for about one to two weeks, and then you'll uh, culture the culture the cells without antibiotic for one to two months. And at that point, you want to retest the cells to see if you did clean up the mycoplasma. Um, if you didn't, then you start the, the antibiotic process all over again, um, and you know, you know, and then go another two months and, and, and retest. Um, <clears throat> since many antibiotics, though, that, of the ones that I just mentioned, are toxic to cells, uh, one thing to be concerned about if your cells do survive the antibiotic treatment and do appear to be clean, you want to make sure you do some other validation of the performance for those cells because you may have inadvertently selected a subset of your cell culture 
that was resistant to the antibiotics and therefore has slightly different physiology than your original culture. Um, so for all those reasons, you know, that the treatment is long and, and uh, difficult and can harm your cells and kill you, in some cases be toxic to your cells, you know, the best bet is to, you know, not waste your time trying that and just start over again if you can. So when in doubt, bleach them out. There you go. <laughs> Um, all right, let's do one more mycoplasma question, and then let's jump over to um, a bunch of these STR questions that have come in. So, Kevin, um, can you actually filter out mycoplasma, presumably you know, from your media? Um, you can. You can. Re you can. There are mycoplasma filters available, and you can you know, reduce the amount of mycoplasma, but it's doubtful you'll ever really be able to filter out mycoplasma total, totally. Uh, because mycoplasma uh, have an absence of a rigid cell wall, they can actually sort of fit through um, standard filtration, you know, 0.2, uh, 0.2 micron filters that are normally used for gel filtration. They can fit through that. 0.1 micron filters, they can go through that, but you marginally. Um, so you want, if you're going to try, you're going to filter it. You want to at least use a 0.1 micron, and you also want to try and use a 0.1 micron filter that um, is made of um, hydrophilic polyether cell phone, sorry, better known as PES uh, membrane, um, and that's going to help retain the the filter, the the mycoplasma that are captured on the filter. That will help retain more mycoplasma um, as, as the material is passing through the filter um, when it's made from that material. But you'll reduce, you'll be able to reduce the amount of mycoplasma, but you won't be able to likely be able to eradicate the mycoplasma completely by filtration. All right, good, good. So um, let's um, shift over and answer some uh, SDR profiling questions. So. Um, Again, uh, our uh, colleague Brian Chase has uh, joined us. Um, Brian, can you um, talk about submitting an SDR cell profile and um, comparing it to the ATCC database? Sure, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to join you here today. It's an honor to be here. Uh, so if you want to run your own uh, profiles, do your own SDR in your own lab laboratory, and you want to authenticate your cell lines without submitting them to our service, uh, we do have the ATCC STR profile database available through our webpage. So if you've uh, achieved an STR profile somewhere else and you want to see if it matches to what's in the ATCC database, which is comprised of the ATCC cell lines, you'll go in and then enter in your allele calls into our database and run a query, which will come back with matches to see if it matches anything that's in the ATCC database, which is comprised of ATCC cell lines. Good, good answer. Um, now, Brian, um, here's an interesting question. Um, I think there may be multiple cell types in my culture. Um, would it be possible to figure out what these cell types are using SDR profiling? Uh, Depending on what you mean by cell types, if there are two different, uh, the cells are from two different donors, as in two different people, such as if you have my cells and your cells in there, when you run the SDR profile, it'll come back as a mix. Uh, will you be able to identify what the mix is? It depends on, you know, culture methods, and uh, one population may be more dense than the other, so we may not be able to identify that it's you and I in there, but we'll both be in there. Okay. Um, now, does ATCC share SDR profiling results with anyone else besides the, the person who orders the result? For SDR profiling service where customer submit samples to us, the only person the results are shared with are the people who have their email address submitted on the submission form. So your results are confidential between ATCC and the customer. Excellent, excellent. All right, we've, we've had a whole bunch more questions jump in. Um, 
I was wondering, and I can throw this up to either of you, but I think, Brian, you're probably best uh, suited to answer this question. Do you have any tests for distinguishing epithelial cells from fibroblasts in a combined culture? And if, you know, you don't know or of any, that's a perfectly good answer. And, yeah, Brian, I'm not, I'm not aware of, of any tests that we have that would be able to perform that. Yeah, I think... I mean, you could stain for a specific epithelial and specific, you know, and then for a different color for a specific fibroblast marker would be um, all that I could really come up with without thinking too hard about it. But, yeah, that's not something that we offer as a service. Exactly, exactly. Um, all right. Ah, this is interesting. Um, can SDR testing distinguish between cell lines that come from a common ancestor, like, say, BSC-1 and Vero cells? That is a great question, and it's very interesting. So at ATCC, the SDR profiling services that we provide are limited to uh, mouse cell lines and human cell lines. Uh, so I'm going to get – I'm not sure what BSC-1 is, but uh, Vero is uh, a monkey cell line. So at ATCC, we wouldn't be able to – distinguish between those. Uh, if there were human cell lines and they came from a common ancestor, then they would likely have share an SDR profile that's very similar. Excellent, excellent. Um, now, Brian, can you go over in more detail maybe how to interpret the SDR report? I guess mean, basically they're, they're getting at um, including how the percentage match is determined. Okay, so currently we use uh, what's called the master's algorithm uh, for the ATCC profile report, and that takes the amount of shared alleles and divides it by the number of alleles that are in the reference database. And that gives you a percentage match of how close your sample is to what's in the, in the database. And that, sir, is why we invited you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, <laughs> now, let's see. Um, this next question, we're looking for someone to help us with mouse cell line authentication. So do you feel like uh, we have a robust set of standard comparative cell lines um, similar to what's available for human cell lines? I guess maybe this is around the creation of the, um, the ANSI standards. Sure. Uh, so great question. Uh, our SDR profiling service for human is, is it has a lot more uh, been around for a lot longer. It has a lot more history, and we've been able to build up the database for that uh, with our ATC cell lines, which are, are vast. Uh, the mouse cell line uh, authentication SDR profiling service is relatively newer at ATCC, and in comparison to the human cell lines that we have at ATCC, the amount of mouse cell lines that we have at ATCC is is limited. So. I, I would say that we, we have the majority of our mouse cell lines authenticated, and that's what we've been using to create our database profiles. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, okay, I'm going to give uh, Brian a break and uh, throw this question at Kevin. So, Kevin, could you maybe reiterate why um, is cell authentication important? Sure. Uh, I mean, for, uh, it's important for a lot of reasons. Um, I mean, you, you're going to get – you don't want to have contaminated cell types uh, because then your results are going to be questionable, um, and you may have to repeat the work, and, you know, that's time and time and money. Um, if you publish on that um, data and then later on it's found out that, you know, you did have a contaminated cell line, two different cell types in there, and that's why the results you reported were a certain way. Um, you know, then it you know, can damage your reputation. Um, and also, you know, the the other thing that's started in the last couple of years, you a lot of grants are requiring that you do authentication, um, and a lot of publication submissions are that you have authenticated cell lines. So it's a good practice to get into to do you know routinely have authentication done for your cell types, have you know SCR and other authenticated. Uh, assays run on your cells so you can verify that the cells are are what they are and they're and they're clean and they're not contaminated with other you know, cells or other contaminants and um, you know just so your your results are going to be cleaner 
and you'll be able to, if you do that, you should you know, be able to get the grants and the publications that you're going after. Okay, good, good. Um, the next two questions um, I'm going to send to Brian. Um, the, the second one you may not have a great answer to, but for the first question, um, if my human cell lines are not from ATCC, can I still submit the samples for STR testing and get a, a comprehensive interpretation of the STR profiling results? Absolutely. So we'll take any human cell line and, and run SDR analysis on them. And, and the results you get this will, will vary between what's available at ATCC and public databases. Uh, so if it's not an ATCC cell line, obviously we can't compare it to the ATCC database. So we'll let you know that it's not a match to any cells that we have at ATCC. Uh, we do also do a comparison for uh, on profiles that are uh, not a match to ATCC using the XBC, uh database, which has many cell lines from DSMV, uh, ProMega, or Sigma, and other cell authentication sources, other databases. And if you submit your cell lines for authentication at ATCC, uh, if you want to submit them once and then you want to submit them again or a, a later passage of the cell line, on your submission form, you can request that we uh, run the profile against previously tested cell lines. Excellent, excellent. Now, this next question um, I, that I've never really kind of thought of, but it's it's more of a threshold. So what percent of cross-contaminated cell lines would need to be present for them to be detected in the culture? I don't have that number on, on top of mind. <laughs> it's a great, great question. Uh, I know that we've run experiments with it. But I can't provide the, the exact number for that. Okay, so that that makes sense. Sometimes in science, the answer is I don't know, or I don't know unless I have a specific case that we've studied and have some empirical evidence mm -hmm. for. So, so that that's totally fine. Um, now, um, can uh, either Kevin or Brian, whoever wants to jump on this question, um, how should I? prep the cells to send to ATCC for STR profiling. I can jump on that, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, on you. each sample submission form, there is a, the criteria is listed for how to prep your, your samples. So they need to be uh, applied to the FPA card at a certain cell density. Uh, and a certain volume needs to be spotted on the FTA card. Uh, some of our customers sometimes will, will take their pipette and we say to spot 40 microliters and they think that maybe, maybe I'll spot 40 microliters, but I'll put it in a couple different places so there'll be more opportunity to, uh, to take punches from. So the punch sizes are relatively small. But what we recommend is we want that density to be spotted in one place. So take your pipette, remove your, your cells, which uh, has the, the densities that are requested on the sample submission form and take that 40 microliters and put it in one drop right in the middle of the card. And that will give us the, the best opportunity to provide a profile. Okay. Um, Brian, is there anything that a customer could do to make um, the SGR profiling process easier for, for you and your group? So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. I appreciate that. Uh, we have awesome technicians at ATCC, and, and we, we appreciate our customers very much. Uh, right now, the submission form that we use in order to collect the data to get the results back to the customer is a paper submission form and requires some handwriting. So we're, there's efforts going on to make that a little bit more digital. But in the meantime, uh, you know, Clear and concise handwriting is is most appreciated on those forms, so that we can get the results back into a timely manner. Also, ensure that before you submit your your form, along with your FTA card to ATCC, that the form is completed fully. So there's a couple sections on there that you need to fill out. You know, name, address, uh, cell line identifier if you would like that that could be optional you know if you want us to try and match it to something you say it is is something we'll try and match it to that and tell you whether or not it is 
or if you just wanted to be blinded to ATCC, you can leave that blank. But there's also a hazard statement on there, and we won't process your we won't process the samples until we get confirmation that, you know, that the samples are not BSL lower than BSL three. Okay, that 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 all sounds good. So um, legible handwriting. Yes, <laughs> and if if you have a business, if you feel like you can't. Uh, Legibly write your email address on there, attach a business card that has your email address, or some customers sometimes will print out labels and stick them on there. We'll we'll take that. Very nice. Very nice. Um, okay. Um, so, Brian, how long can one store DNA sample spotted on a Wattman FTA card? So the, the Wattman FTA cards are made for archival. So... You could, they last a really long time if stored in the correct condition. So after you spot your your sample and uh, you've dried your card, you keep it with a desiccant or you keep it in a dry place, it will last for years. Okay, great, great. Um, now this next question I'm gonna send Kevin's way. Um, I've heard that the Y chromosome can be lost in tumor cells. Um, do you have any specific examples that might show how passage of cells in vitro may affect the rate of that loss? Um, yep. Yeah. So, I mean, we've uh, there's been about 100 reported male cell lines that we have in our ACCC collection that appear to have lost their Y chromosome um, and only yield the X chromosome results for amalgam uh, during the routine SCR analysis. Um, and those, you know, come from a range of different, you know, tumor types from, you know, different sources, bladder, brain, kidney, bone, blood, et cetera, you know, pretty much all throughout the body. Uh, but I can give you information about one specific example. Um, so we ran the, our, uh, <clears throat> the cell line SNU-499, uh, and, uh, and um, it, it has, a, it, it's been shown to have a, it was a Standard case of as cells are in culture, they do have a tendency to lose the Y chromosome. Um, and so the, you know, we tested the uh, MCB um, or the, the well. First, we started with t testing the token material. That's the material that was deposited with ATCC, and that was at passage 11. Um, and then we checked it uh, at created a master cell bank. That was at passage 11, and then created distribution material that's either at passage 16 or passage 17. And throughout as the passage number did increase, um, the Y signal did decrease um, over, you know, as we were going through the culture into the cells. Um, and then by passage 17, um, the Y chromosome is no longer detected during the normal routine SGR analysis, um, even though all the other peaks um, stayed the same in the SGR all the way through. So the SGR profile other than stayed, stayed intact other than the uh, amalgam, amalgam, and I'm probably saying that wrong. Uh, you know, the changed, and we showed us a loss of the Y chromosome over time in culture. Uh, but that's that's fairly normal for, uh, that's been observed, like I said, in a lot of different tumor lines, um, and you know, STR does pick that up. Okay. And if you have anything to comment on that, please feel free. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, that, that all sounds I'm good. That all <laughs> Oh, the other Brian. <laughs> the other Brian. <laughs> no confusion here. <laughs> uh, Brian, did you have anything on top of that? That, that just sounded good. <laughs> Amalogen. <laughs> uh, you, you are the expert in this, so. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, Kevin, if uh, a customer wanted to reach out to you um, about the uh, the SDR or mycoplasma um, services. Um, how can they reach you? Uh, the easiest would be my email address, which is um, kgrady at atcc dot org. That's k g r a d y at atcc dot org. All right, great. Uh, but yeah, um, I guess if yeah, for you know, so I mean, if you have questions on you know, will it work in your application, um, or if you wanted to, you know, uh, you know, any 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 questions you have on anything cell related, um, 
you know, I, the, I'm the product manager for all of, for all the cell biology products. So uh, beyond the, the the test kits and the services, um, if you have any questions about any ATCC product, please uh, reach out to us. Right, and um, I'd like to kind of follow up with that. Um, numerous questions have come in um, about pricing. Um, you can navigate to www.atcc.org slash services slash cell dash authentication, and then navigate to your service of interest um, to, to find out uh, uh, about pricing uh, of these services. All right. Um, so we have one last question that, that's come in that needs addressing. Um, and I'm just going to throw this up to both Brian and Kevin. Um, how does cell, how does cross contamination of cell lines occur? And maybe, um, what can you do to ameliorate this? I can start off with it. Uh, cross contamination can occur from several sources. Uh, one of them can be, you know, your aseptic technique or the environment in which you're working. So, using uh, proper engineering controls when you're doing your work, working inside a BSC, those things can help you uh, maintain your culture in present shape. You know, good technique, keeping the same cell line in a, in a hood one at a time not working on multiple cell lines in the same hood at the same time. Uh, getting your cells from a quality source uh, can definitely help with misidentification. I know that sometimes laboratories will hand cells, hand cells from one laboratory to the other. A colleague may say, hey, I want this, this long cell line. Do you have it? Sure, I have it, and they give it to them, and then eventually they do some authentication on it. It comes back, it is a long cell line, but it may not, not be the one that they're looking for. Uh, other than that, you know, you know, maintaining your stocks appropriately, uh, labeling them, keeping keeping track of passages, those kind of things will help you with uh, cross contamination and identification of your cell lines. Wow! So penmanship would solve the authentication crisis. <laughs> well, generally, when you're dealing with uh, ampules, you like to use some sort of uh, freezer safe label. You know, penmanship helps too. <laughs> right. Right. Um, Kevin, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, that's, that's pretty complete. The only other thing that I've seen be a potential issue, um, if you have cell lines that are that use the same media, you probably don't want to have just one common bottle that you're using to feed all the different cultures that use, say, they're, you know, they're, you're all using DMAN with 10% FBS, so you make up a 500 ml bottle of that, and you've got three cell types that use that. Um, it's probably better practice to make up the master mix of your meat of your complete media and then aliquot that out into separate bottles and label them for cell line a b and c and then only use that because you can also cross contaminate you know, going in and out of the bottle with my pet tips and those kinds of things even if you're only working with one cell in the hood at a time as brian suggested um you know the if there's any contamination into the common media bottle that can get carried through to the other cell lines Okay. Good, good. Well, um, at uh, this time, we'll conclude our Q&A session. Uh, before we close, just a couple of words. I'll come soon. I have another webinar that highlights cell line authentication and focuses on cell culture. So join us on September 8th for Steve Budd's presentation on cell culture basics. Initiate, expand, authenticate, and cryopreserve yourselves with confidence. And a bit of uh, shameless promotion for uh, one of my projects, ATCC now has a podcast uh, called Behind the Biology. So join in to hear experts explore their connections to life science research, touch on the pivotal moments in their careers, and discuss the future for their respective fields. 20 minutes at a time, we tell great stories with great scientists. Uh, so, I'd like to thank Kevin and, and Brian for the excellent presentation, and thank you everyone for attending the webinar. Thanks again, and have a great day.